Hey everyone, PV here and welcome to my new YouTube video. And in today's video we're going to talk about what is probably my favorite format in all of Magic, Seal Deck. And why are we talking about Seal Deck right now? Uh, this is because Wizards of the Coast just announced their plans to insert Seal Deck into the competitive scene. Ever since the pandemic started, uh, all of competitive Magic has been uh, played on Magic Arena, and the formats have been limited to Standard and Historic, which are the constructive formats. On, on Magic Arena. We've never had any limited events whatsoever, but this is about to change. Earlier this week, Watsi announced the very first sealed deck arena open. It's going to take place on February 20th and 21st. Uh, for those who don't know, the arena open is a tournament that it takes place on arena and it is open as an MSS, so anyone can join. You don't have to qualify for it. You just have to go in and pay the, the subscription fee, right? And, and this is paid on either gold or gems, which are the currencies of Magic Arena. And if you do well on day one, you qualify for day two. If you do well on day two, you can earn up to $2,000 in prize money. So this is not in arena currency. This is literal cash that you can make. So these tournaments are very interesting to play. Uh, they are, in my mind, the equivalent of the online Grand Prixes, right? We don't have GPs anymore. We used to have a lot of them. Uh, what we do have now is these arena opens uh, sort of replacing them while the pandemic lasts. Uh, and they're very interesting tournaments to play. Uh, I've played all of them. I'm going to play this one as well. Uh, so if you want to get into the competitive scene at all, I recommend checking them out. I'll leave a link in the description so you can find all the information. On top of that, they also announced that the next qualifier is going to be Kalheim Sealed Deck. So even if you're not interested in the Arena Open, if you want to get into the competitive and professional scene, you will have to go through Kalheim Sealed at some point, at least this season. So it pays off to understand how Sealed actually works, because it is a little bit different than every other format you might have played. The super bare bones explanation of Seal Deck is that you're going to receive six packs of a set, in this case Kaldheim, and you're going to have to build a deck, a 40 card deck, uh, with the cards that you open in those six packs only. You can add any number of basic lands, but you cannot add no basic lands. So at first glance, it might look like it's a very luck based format, because each person is going to open radically different things, right? One person is going to open six bombs, one person is going to open six unplayable rares, one person is going to have all the good cards concentrated in two colors, one person is going to be all spread out. Uh, so there is a lot of variance in seal deck, uh, but there are also many ways to mitigate this variance. There are many things that you need to know to play seal deck uh, that will make it not seem as luck based as it does at a first glance. In this video, I'm going to talk about uh, seal deck theory in general. I'm not going to go super deep on Kaldheim sealed specifically, but I'm going to talk about just how seal deck works. And this is going to apply to Kaldheim as much as to any other seal deck experience that you have. So even if you're not interested in playing this specific tournament or this specific qualifying season, uh, but you believe you are going to be playing Seal Deck in the future, uh, the things that I'm going to talk about will apply to you as well, and I think they'll be helpful in this regard. But before I go a little bit deeper on Seal Deck theory, uh, I want to talk about a question that I'm sure a lot of people are going to have regarding specifically the Arena Open, and that is, should you play best of one or should you play best of three? So in the Arena Open, uh, day two is always best of three, right? so you don't have a choice there. But day one, you can choose to play best of one, or you can choose to play best of three. And in my mind, playing best of one is almost always better. If you play best of one, you need a seven and two record to make day two. So this means you can get up to two losses before you get seven wins. If you play best of three, you need a four and no record to make day two. So you cannot have any losses before you reach four wins. And mathematically speaking, uh, it's just easier to get to a 7-2 record than a 4-0 record, regardless of your win rate. So it is always going to be easier to, to get to get 7 wins when you can afford 2 losses than to just go 4-0 straight. Uh, that is a, a big reason to play best of 1. But other than that, there's also the fact that the competition in best of 1 is usually weaker. Because the newer players, the least uh, experienced players, they don't sign up for best of 3, they sign up for best of 1. This is uh, more pronounced and constricted, I think, than in limited. Uh, but it's still going to apply in limited, because if you're new, you're going to play best of one. If you're not new, if you're experienced, you can play either, right? So this creates a scenario in which uh, best of one has just a weaker competition than best of three, even though there are some very good players that also play best of one. Now, well, best of three is easier on your gems. It does pay out more gems if you make day two. Uh, so for some win rates, if you only care about not losing as many gems as possible, uh, then it's correct to play best of three. But in my mind, the reason you're playing this event is to qualify for day two so that you can earn the, the actual prize money, right? So the main priority should be to qualify for day two. And I think best of one is just the easiest way to do that. So I've always played best of one in these tournaments and I will continue to play best of one until they change how the system works. 
So I recommend that you play best of one as well. And the first tip I have for you regarding seal deck is that power is more important than anything else. Power is more important than synergy. Power is more important than consistency. And if you're used to drafting, which is a form that is considered more competitive than sealed, uh, you might not think that this is the case because in drafting, synergy is very important. But draft is different than sealed. In draft, you're choosing what you're getting. So for those who don't know, drafting is a form where uh, eight people sit in a table, each person opens a pack, selects a card and passes the pack to another person. And then that person picks a card and passes a pack and simultaneously you go this way until each person has opened three packs. So the number of cards that are open in a draft is smaller, right? Because each person is only opening three packs as opposed to six packs from the sealed deck. But each person's also getting all the cards that feed their team that no one else is getting. So for example, if you're in a draft and you're the only person drafting giants, and then you open a card that is very giant centric, right? That imagine no one would want to play this card if they don't have a lot of giants. Uh, you're going to take that card. But if someone else opens that card, they're not going to take it. So they're going to pass it. The other person's not going to take it either. And it's going to get all the way up to you. So you're only opening three packs. But as far as this giant centric card is concerned, if no one else has giants, then you're opening 24 packs. Because if anyone opens this card at any point, it will get to you. So you have a lot more chances to find a synergistic card as long as the table is cooperating. So if you have, you know, two people playing snow, one person playing elves, one person playing giants, uh, then you're going to get to a point where uh, each person is going to find their synergy cards much more easily than in seal deck. And this is something you can see with snow lands, right? There's a snow land in every pack, there's no basic in every pack. Uh, and if you're in a draft, you open 24 of those snow basics. Uh, the table opens 24 of them. Not everyone is going to want them. So if only two people want snow lands, uh, they're going to get 12 zone lands each, uh, roughly speaking, right? That's a lot of snow lands. But in a sealed deck, you don't have that choice. You're just going to open your six snow lands regardless of what other people are doing. So it is much harder to find synergy when you're playing sealed. It's much harder to find a curve. You cannot correct to it. You cannot start taking two drops because, you know, you're, you're low on two drops. You just, how many, however many two drops you open, this is what you have to work with. So it's much, much harder to just make certain cards work if they're based on synergy. This doesn't mean synergy and a mana curve and consistency are in concept that you should apply to a steel deck. Obviously, you should still care about these things, but they're less important than just having raw power. Because in draft, you can make up for not having power by having such a synergistic deck that the cards become more powerful because of the synergy. So if you have, you know, all the elves cards and each card gets better if you have more elves and you have all of them, then they're all going to be great. Right? In sealed deck, this is very unlikely to happen. You're not going to have enough synergy cards to make up for the raw power that you need in sealed deck. So sealed is all about having the most powerful, individually powerful cards that you can find. This means you should go to great lands to play the most powerful cards in your sealed deck, and you should also go to great lands to not play any of the bad cards. For example, if I open uh, Kaya the Inexorable in my pool, I'm going to play that card. It's very, very likely that I will play that card because if I'm playing black, I'll splash for it. If I'm playing white, I'll splash for it. So I'll only not play it if I'm playing a particular combination that does not let me play white or black. And if I have a Kaya, why am I not playing a combination that has white or black, right? It is possible that I just have the nut red green deck and then I don't need to play this black white Planeswalker. But in all likelihood, I am going to uh, make a deck that is able to play Kaya because I think there's a lot of value in playing your more powerful cards. This also means that I'm willing to play an overall worse deck if it gives me access to my best cards. For example, if I open Coma Cosmos Serpent, right, that is a card that I'm going to go to great lengths to be able to play. So if I open that card, I want to be Simic, I want to be base blue-green because that card is so individually powerful that it will win me the game by itself in almost any spot that I cast it. And I believe having access to a card this powerful in sealed deck is worth warping my entire deck around. So I would rather play a slightly worse uh, blue-green deck that has access to that card than a deck that is overall slightly better in a different color combination. So it's not as much about the average power of your cards, but about the power of your most powerful cards. Obviously, sometimes you have such a great deck in a different color combination that you leave Coma in your sideboard and yeah, you know, that's sad but you still have a very good deck. 
But if the alternative is not a very good deck, you know, if your choices are mediocre deck, uh, you know, base Brakdos, or even worse deck, base Simic, you should play the even worse deck because it has access to this card that will win the game by itself, which the other deck doesn't have. So in sealed deck, don't worry too much about consistency, don't worry too much about synergy, worry more about power. So splash for your bombs, play your bombs, even if they make your mana worse, even if you're gonna lose some games because you don't have perfect mana, that is an acceptable cost of playing your best cards in sealed deck. The second tip I have for you is make sure you have a way to deal with bombs. Uh, for the same reason that I told you to play your powerful cards, everyone else is trying to play their powerful cards as well. And there are a lot more in sealed than in draft, because in draft you're only opening three packs per person, and in sealed you're opening six. So that is twice as many rares that you have, twice as many mythics, twice as many uncommons. So there are a lot more powerful cards in this format, and people are going to great lengths to be able to play them, just like I told you to do. This means that facing someone with a bomb level card is not a rare occurrence, it is the norm. You should expect your opponents to have at least one very powerful card, maybe more. Which means that you have to plan for that both during deck building and during gameplay. In deck building, you should overvalue any class of cards that deals with these bombs. For example, counter spells, cards like Disdainful Stroke and Saw Coming. They're much better in sealed deck than in draft, and they're actually big draws towards the color blue. These card spells, like School Raid, are also better in sealed deck than in draft because your opponent is most likely to have their bomb in their hand by the, the middle end of the game. So if they have a, a very expensive card, like a Coma, right, that is likely to be one of the last cards in their hand at some point in the game. So in draft, you play that card, you might get two lands, or you might get a land and a Coma trick. In seal deck, you might get a land and a bomb, or you might get two bombs. So this type of card also gets better in sealed deck. And finally, you should put a big priority on cards that can remove these bombs once they are in play. Something like Fit the Serpent is much better in sealed, where it's likely to have a very important target, than it is in draft, where sometimes it's just going to trade down with their 3-drop. But it is not enough to adjust how you build your deck to deal with these bombs. You also have to adjust how you play the games. And this means being a lot more conservative with your cards that can answer anything. So if I'm playing a draft, I might lean towards, you know, killing my opponent's 4-drop with my Feed the Serpent because this is just how the game is going to go. The games are faster, they're more about uh, board presence and getting an advantage and, you know, synergy, so you want to get rid of one specific thing. Uh, in Sealed, this is not the case. In Sealed, there are going to be very powerful cards that are going to define the game. So the same way you should uh, build your deck towards uh, having as many of those as possible and finding as many of those as possible. So card drawing gets better in Sealed too. Uh, and you want to be able to remove as many of them as possible with discard spells, counter spells, uh, unconditional removal spells. You also have to remember why you put these cards in your deck to begin with, and you have to hold them, uh, often sacrificing life and board presence, just to make sure you don't lose to a specific bomb. And this is obviously going to be the case if you've already seen a specific bomb in a previous game, right? If you're playing best of three, then you know to hold your feed the Semper for the coma that you know is there. But even if you don't know, if you haven't seen the card, you should assume that they have something good. So obviously, don't lose the game if you removal spell or a counter spell in hand, right? Just trying to wait for this particular bomb that you don't even know if it's there. Uh, if you need to play the card, you play the card. But in general, just have a more conservative approach to your unconditional removal spells, to your counter spells, because it's very likely your opponent has a card that can only be answered with these cards from your entire deck. So if you use these cards to answer something else, then you're not going to have them when your opponent plays their bomb, and they're very likely to have a bomb. So be conservative, try to insert other creatures in combat, you know, try to use your life total as a resource. Don't, don't be very trigger happy with your unconditional counter spells and removal spells. Save them for the bombs if you can afford to. And the third tip I have for you is make liberal use of sideboarding. Obviously, if you're playing best of one, this doesn't apply, but some people will play best of three, and day two is always going to be best of three. So even if you play best of one on day one, you need to know this concept for best of three. You will have to play sealed best of three in the arena open and in the Kalheim PDQ if you want to play that. So uh, make sure you use your sideboard as it's meant to be used in sealed deck, which is different than in constricted and in draft. Most of the time, when we play sealed deck, we have a bank of cards that we consider the sideboard cards in our mind. And they're cards that are obviously sideboard cards. For example, Broken Wings. That is a card that you're going to bring in if your opponent has flyers, or if they have artifacts and enchantments. It is obviously a sideboard card. So this is a card that we, we routinely bring in when it's good, because it's just in our mind as a sideboard card. It's what it's meant to do. However, 
uh, in sealed deck, there are a lot of cards that act as cyborg cards, even though they don't look like cyborg cards. Take, for example, Elderleaf Mentor. Elderleaf Mentor is a card that, you know, you may or you may not play. It's not very good. Uh, so it's probably going to be in your sideboard unless you have specific reason to want more elves. Uh, but imagine you play against someone who is playing a black-white deck, and they play, in game one, they play two Usher of the Fallen and two Comas Faithful, right? That is two 2-1 two creatures and two 3-1 creatures already. So at this point, having a 3-2 and a 1-1 one, one for one card for four mana can be quite valuable, because you know that the 1-1 one, one has a use against this particular person. It is going to trade with their powerful 1-drops or with their 3-drops. Right, so at this point, you should probably consider bringing that card in just because of how the 1-1 one, one that it creates matches up against your opponent's deck. So even though it doesn't look like a cyborg card, it is a powerful cyborg card for the right situation. You can also adapt your curve to match whatever your opponent's playing. For example, uh, imagine you have you know, a random 2-mana two 2-2 two two in your sideboard. You're not interested in attacking for 2, so you're not playing that. But you're playing against an opponent who has a lot of very cheap creatures that you need to be able to block. So you just bring that 2-mana two 2-2 two two in. Right? Uh, and the reverse is also true. Imagine you have a defensive creature, but your opponent is playing a super controlish deck, the game is going to go very long. You don't need this creature in your deck. You just take it out and you bring, you know, a bad 7 mana 6-6 six, six creature, because that is what you can do to combo what your opponent is doing. So Sealed is all about context in games 2 and 3. Uh, your opponent is going to be playing a radically different deck than your previous opponent, which means that you should present a radically different deck too, if you have the ability to do that. You can, for example, change your entire colors to match what your opponent is presenting. For example, imagine you have a deck and you believe blue is, is a better color because you have access to two solid coming and two disdainful strokes as your answer to bombs, right? That, that, this is a pretty good number of answer to bombs. But then you play against an opponent who plays a coma, Cosmo Serpent, which is a card that cannot be countered. So all your answers to bombs are useless versus this particular bomb. But in your sideboard, you have black, which is a color that you consider worse than blue, and you have two Fit the Swarms. So there is your answer. You have answers to the card, you just have to change your colors. So what do you do? You remove all the blue from your deck, and you add in all the black, because the black is doing something for you that the blue wasn't doing. And this is something that in draft you can almost never do, but in sealed you will have all these black cards in your sideboard. They might not be as good as the blue ones, but for this particular matchup, they are. The tip here is basically don't be lazy when it comes to sideboarding in sealed deck. A lot of people build a deck and that's it, right? They're willing to change one or two cards, but this is the deck that they have. And you should not do that in sealed. You should know that you have the ability to change your deck entirely. Sometimes uh, you've decided that, you know, blue green ramp is the best archetype that you can have. But then you play against someone who has a much, much, much better blue green ramp deck. So if you're just trying to ramp into one specific card, they're going to do the same as you, but better, and you'll lose every time. So what do you do? You change into white red aggro, even though that deck is in theory a little bit worse, because that is how you can win the game. You can try to kill your opponent before they get to the late game. If you're trying to get to the late game with your blue green deck, you can never beat them, because they will have a better late game. So be flexible. Right? It doesn't mean that you have to change your deck every time, or even most of the time, but you have to know that you have the ability to change your colors, you have the ability to adapt your curve, you have the ability to you know, change your mana base during sideboarding, depending on which cards are more important. You can add a land, you can remove a land, you can change colors. So you can do all these things in sealed deck, and most people don't act like they can. Most people just sideboard like they would in Constructor. You know, they bring in one disenchant and take out one other card. You should not do that. You should have a more open mind when it comes to sideboarding in sealed deck, and you should not be lazy. You should go through the effort of changing your deck because it is worth it. It will win you a lot of games. That's what I have for today. But just to sum it up, power is the most important thing in a seal deck. So try to play your powerful cards, try to play cards that find your powerful cards, that protect your powerful cards, and try to play answers to their powerful cards because they are going to have powerful cards too. And these are the cards that define the game. So the most powerful cards are more important than uh, the average card in each person's deck. It's all about the most powerful cards. And then uh, sideboard more, you know, be more flexible. You can change a lot more than you think. If you like this video, make sure to check out my Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash pvddr. There you can support my work a little bit more while also getting some cool perks on top of it. And special thank you to my three biggest supporters, uh, Mattia Giardini, Geoffrey Whitehead, and OCD. I really appreciate the support and I'll see you next week.